Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and to getting in touch with our own humanity. The Field of Cloth of Gold is one of the most famous foreign policy events to happen in the 16th century, and Professor Richardson wrote an amazing book about the event. I'm so thrilled to have him on the show. Before we get started, though, just a few bits of normal housekeeping. First, this podcast is a member of the Agora Podcast Network, and I would urge you to go to agorapodcastnetwork.com to check out all of the great member podcasts and find a new favorite. But wait until after you listen to this one, though. Don't do it right now. Also, go to englandcast.com, E-N-G-L-A-N-D, englandcast.com for full show notes and to sign up for my super cool mailing list, which gets you extra mini casts, discounts, and giveaways of books and things like that. One thing on the site right now is a fun quiz to see which Tudor monarch you are for those times when you've got like five minutes and you want to find out whether you're a Henry VIII or an Elizabeth. Interestingly, from the people who've taken it already, there are an awful lot of Edwards out there. So go to englandcast.com for all that good stuff. On to Professor Glenn Richardson, author of The Field of Cloth of Gold, published in 2013. He is a professor of early modern history at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, London. He is also a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, and is an honorary fellow of the Historical Association. He has published extensively on Tudor England's political and cultural relations with continental Europe and on European Renaissance monarchy. In addition to journal articles and chapters in edited collections, his other books are The Contending Kingdoms, France and England, 1420 to 1700 from 2008. Also, Renaissance Monarchy, The Reigns of Henry VIII and Francis I and Charles V from 2002, and Tudor England and Its Neighbors, co-edited with Susan Doran, 2005. His current main projects are Biography of Cardinal Wolsey and editing a collection of essays on Renaissance cardinals. So we started off the interview with me asking him what the background was to the Field of Cloth of Gold. Well, the Field of Cloth of Gold really begins um, as early as a as 1513, when Henry VIII does his first invasion of of France um, personally and is able to conquer the town of Terroir and um, the the city of Tournai um, and really tries to establish himself as a a major player on the world stage through uh, this conquest of a couple of towns in France. Obviously, what he was trying to do was conquer the whole of France, but that didn't quite work out. And by the time, to cut a long story short, by the time uh, he's in a position to try and have another go, uh, his allies, Ferdinand of Aragon and the Emperor Maximilian, um, are no longer interested in this this project of a joint attack on the um, kingdom of Louis of France. It's it's Henry, and, and I think a very important person in the story is Cardinal Wolsey, who comes up with the idea that instead of making war, if you haven't got any allies, if you haven't got enough money, which Henry doesn't, why not make peace in a magnificent way? And the first time they do that is when Mary Tudor, that is the sister, not the daughter of Henry VIII, uh, a very young, very pretty woman of uh, still in her teens, is married to Louis XII to form the first Anglo-French alliance of Henry's reign uh, in 1514. She's the first and only English princess to become Queen of France in 1514. That all works very splendidly as far as Henry and Wolsey are concerned because the Tudors are seen to be a powerful international um, dynasty. However, it doesn't last very long because when Louis XII, she's married to him in October 1514 and he dies in January 1515, bringing to the throne a much younger, more dynamic monarch, Francis I, who within nine months of his accession completely out does Henry VIII by conquering not just a couple of towns in France, but an entire duchy in northern Italy, the Duchy of Milan. Uh, and it becomes, the, I suppose, the, what Henry wanted to be, the, uh, the most glamorous, attractive, successful European prince of his day. And over the course of the next couple of years, um, between 1515 when Francis becomes king and 1518, um, 
Henry and Wolsey are desperate to do anything to try and stop this man from outclassing Henry even further. Uh, and they decide to go back to basics and say, well, if we can't stop him by, by battle, because they can't, then why not try and make a, not just a peace between England and France, but an entire European peace um, to enable Henry to pose as the peacemaker rather than the warmonger. And that is, that is the, 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 as tight as I can put it, that's the background to what happens in 1618, um, which is the Treaty of Universal Peace. Pope Leo X has been very concerned about the, the rise of the Ottomans in the East and the threat as he perceives it to Western Europe and wants to bring together European princes in a, a truce but Cardinal Wolsey is one step ahead of him and says, well, we, we don't need a truce. What we need is an international league of cooperation between European princes. And the best prince to lead that is not Francis I or anybody else. It's my king, Henry. And that, um, amazingly, is what actually happens. In 1518, uh, most of the principalities, republics and principalities of, of Western Europe come together at, in London and agree the Treaty of Universal Peace. It's a bit like the League or the United Nations almost, you know, 500 years ago, um, next year in fact. Um, and the linchpin, the kind of thing that pulls the whole thing together, is a new alliance between England and France, and that alliance is secured by a personal meeting between Henry VIII and Francis I. And that is why, in 1518, they agree to this meeting. It's meant to happen a year later in 1519, but because of the death of the Emperor Maximilian and the uh, election in his place of the Emperor Charles V, um, of course the, the, the third player in all of this, um, the two kings don't meet. But, but eventually the climate is right enough that by the summer of 1520 uh, they come together uh, at this event, which we now know into history as the Field of Cloth of Gold. I love the idea that that Woolsey had and with this whole thing that Henry would be the arbiter. If people had problems with each other, they would like take it to Henry. How did he pull that one off? Well, he, well Woolsey is, is, in the time that he's organizing the Treaty of London in 1518, Woolsey's playing a double game. On the one hand, he's promising the papacy that uh, Leo X, um, that, that he's going to work as fully as he can to bring about this truce, which will be the prelude to a so-called crusade against the Ottoman Turks. But at the same time, he's trying to tell Henry that by participating in this League of International Peace, he will become uh, the foremost prince. And the way that he demonstrates to Henry that he will be that is to make Henry the arbiter of the, the peace treaty. And it's very interesting, he doesn't actually tell Pope Leo that's what he's doing until it's too late. Henry is already proclaimed as the arbiter, because in theory, of course, it should be the Pope who's the arbiter, but Wolsey knows perfectly well that's work. Uh, and that's not what he wants. He wants Henry to have the, the foremost role uh, in this new style of peace. Uh, so, he, he's, as I say, he's playing a double game, which is the whole history of Wolsey's career, if you think about it, uh, until he can no longer... 1529. Um, so that's why. Okay. <laughs> so interesting. Okay. Um, get, can you explain just your book? You spent a lot of time explaining all the logistics and, you know, what was needed to get the supplies through France and from England and everything like that. Can you um, just explain some of that, like how, how people went about planning it? Okay. Well, the decision to meet finally is taken in uh, the late 1519 that is going to happen in the summer of 1520. But actually, they've been planning it for about 18 months beforehand because originally the two kings were going to meet a year earlier. And at that time, Wolsey starts drawing up um, regulations. He publishes um, a, a sort of pronouncement in which he more or less says these are the following things that are going to happen. These are all the people who are going to go to this event. Um, this is where you have to be by such and such a date. And he sends these letters out to throughout the kingdom 
only one of which actually survives, which is very lucky because it gives us the text of, of what um, lots and lots of gentry and nobles would have had, basically saying, you should turn up with a retinue, dress splendidly um, at such and such date at Dover or wherever, um, ready to be going to Europe. At the same time, Wolsey orders through the royal court to buy up wheat and cattle uh, and uh, all, all the things that are needed, food, sheep, uh, <laughs> anything and everything, um, which are all to be assembled um, at the port of Dover um, by late May uh, 1520. Um, and then he also organises shipping. Um, so he gets the Lord Warden of the Sank Ports and various other naval officials and commanders to either buy or hire several, in the end, several hundred ships or, or vessels, barges, to take a lot of this stuff across from England across to the English colony as Calais. Because uh, the meeting takes place um, not very far away from Calais. It, it's technically on English territory within the, the so-called Pale of Calais, the town, between the town of Guin, which is controlled by the English, and Ardre, which is a French town. And so it's technically English territory uh, on which all this happens. Um, he also sends out orders to the garrison, of, the Tudor garrison at Calais, to go and buy uh, more materials, um, horses, uh, sheep, and all the rest of it food-wise. Um, uh, to, to bring uh, for this event. At the same time, uh, they start in England building what becomes known as the Crystal Palace, that is the, the temporary palace made of wood and glass and canvas, um, which, which is where Henry and Wolsey entertain their French counterparts during the, the Field of Cloth of Gold. And it's built, it's, it's sort of framed up. Um, in, it's a bit like putting together like a piece of Ikea, um, no, furniture. <laughs> so you build all the bits and then you ship it across um, to uh, the Pale of Calais and then you put it together um, uh, in a flat pack with screwdrivers and all the rest of it. You put it together over the course of a couple of months just immediately prior to the event. I mean, it, it is still astonishing um, how, how they managed to do that. Um, if your listeners can imagine something like a, an Oxford or Cambridge University college where there's a quadrangle in the middle with buildings around either side, or if you know, you know Hampton Court Palace, that that temporary palace was about as big um, as as one of those. So it 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 really was an astonishing feat of of, of carpentry and technology transportation to get this over. Um, they buy glass. Um, in the Netherlands uh, and in other places around because glass is not yet being made to a sufficiently high quality in England so they buy it off the continent um, and they, it just costs in our terms millions um, it's a bit like in the book I make reference to the, the uh, Olympics in 2008 in Beijing that extraordinary the Bird's Nest Stadium which the main stadium, which was the biggest and grandest, and, and people were impressed by its scale and size. Well, something very similar is happening um, for the English. Um, French, the French king doesn't have a palace of the same size, but what he has is a whole series of huge tented pavilions, um, which um, he builds just outside the town of Ardres. And they are gigantic in size and covered in the most incredibly expensive material. So they're basically canvas, but they're covered over in silk, uh, in velvet, um, all with fleur-de-lis and gold and silver. Um, it must have looked, probably to our eyes, it looked a bit kind of blingy, really, because it would have been quite brash. But um, it's the scale of everything, and that's what's important about this event, because... Whatever the reasons for it, and whatever the, the, the diplomacy and the politics of it, what it's really about is two kings demonstrating to each other, not by warfare, but by spectacular uh, peace, their, their demonstrative power. If I can do this, get all this, you know, our, millions in our terms of materials together, if I can bring 6,000 people with me, which is the size of a, of a late medieval army anyway, uh, 
If I can bring all these things together and entertain you for two weeks just because we're declaring a peace between us, imagine what I can do to you if you break this peace. That's the message of the Field of Cloth of Gold. That's what both sides are doing. Um, and if you play by the rules, then I will play by the rules, and we can be peaceful and friendly. If you don't, then this, you know, imagine what I will do with you if I am, you know, being serious. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the idea of having the tournament as well, right? I mean, it, w it was actually That's a right. tournament that was going on too, right? Yes. Uh, bizarrely or ironically for us in the 21st century, the, for the medieval elites, the way in which you celebrate peace is actually to pretend to be at war because you've got to make peace as exciting and as glamorous and as um, spectacular, um, in one way at least, as war is. And the best way to do that is to get a whole team of knights together, demonstrate your physical and your military prowess. Again, it goes to the point I was just making. You know, if we can assemble this kind of talent uh, for a, for a mil paramilitary game of, of, of a tournament, um, this is the guarantee that if we need to, we can do it for real. Um, I mean, the whole thing is a bit of a showmanship, and I'm not pretending that, that anybody thinks that, that it really, um, that the Henry and, and Francis are deadly sure that they can, if necessary, go to war with each other. But it, it, it's a bit like modern diplomacy. It, it's a kind of um, attempt to convince the other side by your, by your preparedness to do this, that you'll do anything um, to, to have your name respected. And the tournament is, is, you're right, the tournament is, is exactly the point. That's why they meet. They don't meet to talk about anything. It's not a negotiation. There's no extended um, discussions like we would have in a modern summit where you'd have, you know, the two leaders and all their teams of diplomats chatting about this and negotiating a treaty. That's all been done. Um, they just ratified at the, the event itself. What this is about is, as it were, physically investing themselves in in this outcome uh, between the two of them. So, so a tournament is an incredibly important aspect of the field of crop of gold. Interesting. And then can you tell me a little bit about, uh, you kind of touched on it, the fact that the French were coming onto English soil, and that seemed like an important point that Woolsey um, was trying to negotiate, being able to have Henry say that he was welcoming the French and the whole idea of um, who had the kind of, who was welcoming whom and the rules of court associated with that. Um, it seemed like that was kind of a, a big part of it. Yeah. And even I remember in the book, you talked about like how even as they were approaching each other, who was going to like get off the horse first and having Woolsey walk midway between them and all this kind of stuff. So can yes. you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yes. The, the issue is they really should be meeting on neutral territory. And that was the original plan. But really, there, there isn't much neutral territory. I mean, right on the border, et cetera, between, between France, France and England. Um, so they realize that's not very practical. Um, so they decide, uh, they, they find a space where it is possible to bring their entourages together. And that, just the geography determines it, that happens to be within the English Pale of Calais. And so the, this idea is first put to the French, and they're very reluctant. Um, and the trade-off is uh, because, as you say, um, the person who is the host has the highest status. So if the meeting between the, the first meeting between the two kings, which happens on the 7th of June, 1520, um, if this is to happen uh, on English territory, that's all right. But Francis has to have something um, in recompense for that. So what he gets, he has the right to determine the rules of the tournament. So in a sense, he, he can take back to his people, OK, I had to go onto the English king's territory to meet him, but... I'm the guy who's actually in charge of the tournament, which is the most important thing. That's, after all, what the whole thing's about. So that it's a good illustration of how to late medieval elites peacemaking works. Both sides have to get something out of it. If one side feels that it's losing, it won't work. And that's how they do it in this instance. So Francis comes on to um, English church, as you say. There's a great deal of nervousness um, in the morning of the 7th of June. Both sides are worried about, you know, secret um, 
uh, armies that might be hidden behind the hills almost to attack them? Is this going to be an ambush? Um, are they really going to meet them? It just shows the, the real rivalry and tension between these two kings who publicly talk about being equals and brothers and you know, all the rest of it uh, in, in terms of the peace treaty, but who are really quite, quite ambivalent about each other. They admire each other. They're impressed by each other, but they're also very suspicious of each other. And so Francis does come on um, to English territory. Uh, Wolsey's there to assure everybody of things alright. And actually, the meeting goes very well. The two kings embrace each other, and they go and go into this very large tent, this pavilion, and they spend most of the afternoon chatting and talking. And, and actually, it, it goes much better than probably Wolsey was expecting. In fact, it goes on so long that he gets worried that it's getting dark, and that, and they should go back home. So eventually he breaks it up and the two kings um, go go back home. But yes, that, that's a very it's a very crucial moment of of, um, of, of protocol and, and the status of two kings having to be respected. Yeah. And it, you kind of touched on it with the worrying that it was an ambush. And it seems like it was one of these things that until it actually happened, there were all of these risks that it wasn't going to happen and all of these worries that even, you know, within a couple of weeks beforehand, there was worries that it might not actually happen. And then tell me a little bit yes. about kind of what was going on then and, and then bringing Charles into it as well. And yeah, yeah just tell sure. me a little bit about that. Okay, well, yes, this, this, this plan of this meeting between the two kings has been around since the signing of the Treaty of London, um, Treaty of Universal Peace in 1518. Um, and um, by the time it actually happened, uh, Charles V, who was the overlord of the Netherlands, and probably Francis's most keen rival rather than Henry, really, um, he is very worried about this planned meeting because... Of course, he is, as history will famously relate when it comes to the divorce, he is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. He feels that he ought to be uh, not left out of this. So he does, in fact, arrange for, um, he, he, he was sailing back to the Netherlands um, in 1520. And having never really particularly been interested in Henry before, he suddenly decides, oh, I'd love to go and visit my aunt and my uncle in England. Um, so he does. He pops in. Just at the end of May 1520, Henry and Catherine are coming down from London to Dover to go across to the Field of Cloth of Gold. And just before that, um, he, Henry and Catherine all meet together and have a kind of long weekend at Canterbury. Um, and, uh, that, and he promises also that he'll meet Henry immediately after. So that aspect of it has got to be factored in as well, that, that really, although it's ostensibly a meeting between the English and the French, because of the power of the Habsburg Emperor, it's almost a, a tripartite meeting which goes on between May and uh, June 1520. The French are aware that Charles is planning to do this, and that makes them feel rather suspicious. Now, the English also get suspicious about what the French are doing or not doing, because, as I was relating earlier, the English are busy shipping food and provisions and building this temporary palace and, indeed, other tents and things which, which the English also have in the Pale of Calais. And so they're getting on with it. And, of course, they send spies across to France to see what's happening at the neighbouring town of Ardeva, which is where the French are going to be based. And they don't see a lot happening. And they think... Ooh, um, hang on, we're building all this stuff. What are they up to? Or what are they not up to? What they don't realise is that all the, I talked about the, the magnificent tents and things of the French king, and also his entourage, his mother, his sister, all the great French nobles, etc. All of that is being built about 200 miles away in the town of Tours. The English don't really know that, um, but that's where all the canvas is being made and, and stitched together. That's where all the beautiful fabrics are being established, uh, are sent to, and, and, and they're all packaged up and then sent by a series of wagon trains and horses um, up uh, from southern France, uh, southern central France, up into the north to where Ardre is. So they only arrive quite late, um, and literally sort of two or three weeks before the event is due to start, by which time the English are well advanced with their preparation. So there is immen immense uh, suspicion. Equally, the French have sent out um, orders 
for canon and um, the, these things called arquebuses, which are primitive kind of rifles, massive stockpiling of arms, and not at the site of the field, but in the towns around it, just in case something goes wrong. So both sides are suspicious of the other, right up until the last moment, as I was describing earlier, even up to the very moment where the kings meet um, in the evening of the 7th of June. So can you tell me, we have the meeting now, what are some of the highlights of the event? The meeting is, is basically a, a tournament which goes for about 10 days. So each day or every second day, they don't, they don't just on Sundays and stuff like that. But essentially, um, each day is taken up with the different competitions. There's um, jousting um, at the tilt, but there's also competitions such as um, where they fight against on foot against each other uh, you know, over barriers and things like that. And there's also kind of free-ranging, what they call the melee, which is a kind of general, you know, all-in you know, bash-up between knights. Of course, I have to be very clear that the English and the French knights and the nobles and indeed the kings themselves do not fight. The kings never fight against each other. They are the, what they call the holders, the tenon, the, the holders of, of the tournament. and mixed groups of English and French knights fight against their team. So both teams are both English and French. It would be too, it would be too difficult to have you know, an English team, our French team. It's not you know, rugby or something. <laughs> it, it's a mixed team. Then when they're not fighting, like on Sundays, they have huge banquets. So Francis will take his leading members of his entourage from Ardre over to Guine, where they'll be received by Queen Catherine and Cardinal Wolsey, and the leading members of the English court, and they're given uh, this banquet, which goes for you know three or four hours at a time. Hundreds of different dishes are served. Uh, again, another display of material wealth, of um, the dishes on which the food is served, the quality of the food itself, the, the style and uh, degree of, of the, the cooking that, that's involved, um, and the sheer spectacle of the presentation. Meanwhile, Henry with his sister Mary and also Queen Catherine, uh, will go across to the French town of Ardre to be entertained with similar um, spectacle, spectacle and um, very rich foods, etc. And they have three occasions like that. Um, the other big highlight of the event is the mass that Cardinal Wolsey uh, holds on the last day, the last official day which is um, uh, high, high Summer Day, the 24th of June. Um, and that's people who may know the painting of the Field of Cloth of Gold at Hampton Court. There's a kind of dragon that appears in the sky, um, um, and people have speculated as to what that is. And it seems reasonably clear that the, the, this dragon that goes across the mass, which is being held where, where the, the, the cardinal pronounces a, a plenary indulgence granted by the Pope for everybody who's attending the field for remission of sins and all the rest of it. In the middle of why he's doing that, which pleases Cardinal Wolsey no end because he loves to be in the centre of attention and being, you know, the Pope's man as well as Henry's man. This strange kind of dragon-like thing flies across over the top of the mass and it's thought it probably is a kite um, but inside the kite is all this uh, kind of pyrotechnics that, that make it float in the air and belch flames and all the rest of it. And it's called the dragon, and people may have seen the, the, the picture in which it appears. Um, it's thought it might be um, either a Welsh dragon celebrating Henry um, and you know, his Tudor ancestry, or perhaps more plausibly, a kind of weird um, take on the salamander. The salamander was the, the emblem which Francis I had. And if you look at any of the, the emblems of Francis at the chateaus in the Loire Valley, etc., uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of lizard, the salamander, that the Francis I lizard belches fire and water, etc. Haven't got time to go into the reasons why Francis picks the salamander as his emblem, but it, um, it, it might be that it was a kind of English compliment to the French king because we know that the, the, the firework, the dragon, the, the, the kite was made in England and taken across to France. 
Um, so it's probably a kind of tribute to Francis the Salamander um, or Francis the First. Um, so in, in, in terms of, you know, these are the highlights of the field of cloth of gold. Um, in another way, though, it's just the sheer spectacle of having, um, you know, the highest ranking um, aristocrats in France. They're in there are perhaps a dozen or more of them, perhaps more like two dozen. You know, the Duke of Bourbon, the king himself, the, the king's mother, um, the kind of people who just never see all in one place together at one time unless they're in Paris or something like that. Equally, uh, the, virtually the entire nobility, because England is a much smaller country, of course, than France, and so it has a much, there are many fewer nobles per square inch, so to speak, um, than in France. But virtually the whole of the nobility of England is shipped across in this fleet of ships um, with the king. I mean, that would have been an incredible thing to watch. Nothing like that had ever really happened on such a scale before. Um, and uh, as well as the buildings and, and just the sheer visual remains of, of where they stayed. So, and the whole thing really was, um, at the time, described by commentators and ambassadors, you know, the Venetian ambassadors, the Milanese ambassadors writing, you know, back home saying, you, know, you have never seen anything like this. You know, I've never seen anything. Like this. It's just incredible what's happened. So it generated, it was, it, it was a kind of, I can't quite think of a, a modern analogy apart from something like the Olympic Games, but it, it really did focus attention on the potential power of England and France in a way that has, has rarely happened in, in that period of Renaissance history when, you know, the, the Empire and, and, and Renaissance Italy were the focus of attention. Suddenly, for, for a time, it was the events in, in northern France, you know, technically English territory, um, which held Christendom agog. Wow. And I, I would be, um, I don't know, I don't really want to ask about it, but it is like the most famous thing people think of is the wrestling match. Can you just like briefly <laughs> talk okay. about the, the sure. wrestling match? <laughs> um, well, Henry, the wrestling match did apparently occur. Henry and Francis are both very athletic men. Um, Henry's what, 29, Francis is about 24 or so. Um, when this happens, um, both six, over six foot, Two, they, you know, they're, they're very well built. They're, they're used to a life of physical exercise, etc. And wrestling was part of the um, the kind of um, sports that gentlemen did, particularly in France. Henry and Francis were having a drink one evening, and for whatever reason, Henry decides to challenge Francis to a bout of wrestling, um, which Francis at first refuses. But then, okay, so they get down to it, take their cloaks off, and then grapple with each other. And Francis had been trained by a Breton wrestling master who was very good, and he throws Henry to the ground. Mm, that's no good. <laughs> oh, oh dear, that's not good. <laughs> um, so somehow, um, so he, he sticks his arm out and you know helps Henry up, and Henry says, "Oh, very good. You know, well, let's have another bout." You know, and um, kind of best of three kind of thing. Um, and, we, and, and Francis refuses to have another bout with him. Um, and it was very, very embarrassing for Henry because Henry prided himself on his physical fitness, on his strength and, and, his, uh, and his capacities. But I guess it's one thing to be able to sit on a horse and you know, charge with a lance against somebody else, but to be able to overthrow someone whose weight or height you know, might be used differently and, and, and if he's got more technique, um, it, it just it's just interesting that... that I mean, I, I talk about it in the book as, as Henry, I think, frustrated at the protocol and every gesture which one king made had to be reciprocated by the other. And he almost, I think I put it like something, he almost like literally wanted to come to grips with, literally get hold of Francis and shake him and say, look, <laughs> look what I can do. And, uh, but, um, and he expected to win, um, but uh, he didn't. Um, and equally, Francis uh, made the point and he didn't need to um, repeat it. It, it, was, you know, uh, it was obvious that, that, that he had the greatest success, and I think that pleased him very much. <laughs> sure. So then what were the kind of long-term results of the mm. field, and why is it important for us now even to, to study it? Right. 
Um, a good question. Um, in one way, it, it was just a fairly ephemeral event for the reasons I've been talking about. It, it was designed to put the, the stamp on, to physicalize, to celebrate um, a potential peace within Europe, which ultimately didn't come to anything because of the third person in the triangle that we've been talking about, namely Charles V. Um, and so in, in one way, it's an example of, uh, I don't know, diplomatic brinksmanship, uh, one-upmanship, a kind of display, theatre, if you will, diplomatic theatre. And you can accept that. And I think that's perfectly valid to, to, um, to discuss and to, to look at in itself. But when you think that these people spent you know, millions and millions of dollars or pounds in our terms for this event... Um, that they, they physically moved themselves hundreds of miles to attend this event. I mean, people don't do that. Um, it's just a bit of spin, surely. You know? There is an element of spin in the whole thing, and I wouldn't deny that for a minute. Um, but I think it gives us, as, as people looking back at the past, it gives us a, a very um, clear insight into the kind of mentality um, of the elites of the 16th century, not not necessarily common people. Though, of course, what, what we mustn't forget is that there were hundreds and hundreds of ordinary common workers, um, seamstresses, uh, builders, carpenters, glaziers, um, uh, just ordinary laborers who are paid, you know, tuppence a day kind of thing, um, to, to bring this event about. Um, and... We shouldn't forget them as well, but it, it in in terms of uh, trying to get an understanding of of why medieval people behaved as they did, um, I think that that's useful. Um, in terms of the, the political consequences, the most immediate ones are that people have dismissed that the field of cloth of gold as as just being spin and, and a deception of the French by the English. In fact, if you look at the record. Um, uh, although Henry meets Charles V immediately afterwards uh, and they sign an agreement that they won't make peace against each other and all the rest of it, there's nothing in that agreement which undermines the Anglo-French alliance at the time. If Francis plays by the rules, then I think it was possible that Wolsey and Henry would have been in a position where they would have to have supported him against Charles. The problem is that about a year later, in 1521, Francis does break the rules. He launches a, um, a covert attack against imperial territory. Um, he, he's, I haven't got time to go into all the reasons why, but he's, he's very frightened that Charles V is going to um, get into Italy and, and um, uh, prevent him from returning to Milan and extending his own uh, control over Italy. So in a vain attempt to try and distract Charles, he launches um, an attack in the spring of 1521 against Charles V. Now that is, although he tries to portray it as, as a kind of, you know, he was provoked, that is a clear breach of the Treaty of Universal Peace. Um, and although he tries to use what happened at the Look Off the Gold as a lever to get Henry to support him, both Henry and Wolsey realised that actually, not only is he in the wrong, but actually the, most, the stronger figure uh, by 1521-1522 is Charles. And so my final point about all of this, I guess, is that you know, what explains it is Wolsey, who's the genius behind it, trying to keep Henry at the forefront of European affairs. And if that means completely, as it were, overthrowing the apparent message of the field of public gold, then he'll do that. Um, but he wouldn't see it like that. He would say, well, Francis, you attacked Charles, you broke the rules, therefore we warned you, um, and now you're going to feel what it's like to be attacked by us. Um, and that is essentially what happens when war breaks out in 1522. Of course, Woolsey then very quickly, realising that Henry can't afford to be at war for very long, he very quickly patches things up with Francis, uh, or is in, is, is in the attempt of trying to do so when Francis suffers a catastrophic defeat in 1525 at the Battle of Pavia, 
um, and that changes the whole perspective of the game. So, um, and that's why the field seems so pointless in 1520. But in 1520, they didn't know what was going to be happening in 1525 any more than we do <laughs> now. What's going to be happening in five years' time? Thanks again to Professor Glenn Richardson for dropping by and talking with us. And please do go to englandcast.com to check out his books. He has some great YouTube lectures that he does and more information on the field of cloth of gold. Thanks so much. Blown on the wind, a scent for maybe sweating. Blown on the wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a bird in Bauerbrich, that's all his family is on sea. 